right. Well, I'm really glad to be here. Um, I am a journalist, but Dr. Severance, I promise I am not going to talk at all about how terrible MOOCs are. Um, <laughs> that will not enter at all. So the other morning, I was getting ready for work um, with my seven-year-old son sitting at my feet telling me all about the latest house he had built in Minecraft. Um, this typical morning routine was interrupted by a text that I got from a local editor telling me about a problem with a comment on the site. Someone was posting harmful insinuations about one of our principals uh, in the community, and um, she wanted me to take care of it. So I quickly navigated to the problem story, and um, as I became distracted, my son got upset with me. And uh, I had to you know, apologize to him and explain that this is something I have to deal with right now. You know, I tried to explain it in, in terms he would understand. Someone's being bullied on the website, and I have to deal with it. Um, he understood then and watched with a very serious expression as I got in there and, and blocked that comment. Now, as you may know, this is not exactly an unusual situation for online communities. How many of us have seen something uncivil online before, right? Yeah. Um, People are sometimes less civil online than they are in real life, and um, many believe that anonymity is the problem. If only people had to put their names to their opinions instead of hiding behind their keyboard, online discussions would be civil, they say. Well, I disagree that the problem and the solution is that simple. Um, I've seen where it's being tried, and frankly, these, this real names thing isn't working. Also, there's a lot of good that comes with anonymous commentary, as long as it's contained within a well-managed community. Now, I went in and removed this, print, this principal comment, but I also emailed the commenter and said, you know, if you have this, any information to share, please share it with us. And so they did, and as it turns out, there, there are some problems um, at this school, and it may turn out that this comment was the tip we needed to uncover an important local story. Now, online communities have been around since the 70s, starting with bulletin boards and list servers and evolving to chat rooms in the 80s. I'm going to be like this politi that politician and get a quick drink here. Uh, evolving to chat rooms in the 80s and sharing platforms like Napster in the 90s. In the early 2000s, forums came online and then followed by blog and news comments. But all along, anonymity was the norm. However, with the explosion of social media in the past five years, many people, yourselves included, I'm sure, had become comfortable getting, um, using their real life identities in limited ways online. And I think that's causing a backlash against anonymous commentary. So millions of people are on Facebook using their real names, and they see no reason why people who comment on, anonymous, uh, on news sites can't um, use their real names too. But the thing is, there's a big difference between posting cute cat photos on Facebook using your real name, and commenting about a serious problem at your child's school, for example, using your real name. Um, the kind of comment that this person wrote anonymously, being the new kid in school, our son was faced with bullying. Now, in my position, I often hear people pine for the old days of letters to the editor, when everyone had to put their names to their opinions. But an interesting historical point is that up until the 1960s, anonymous letters were common. A 2005 research paper in the Journal of Mass Media Ethics determined that editors began requiring real names for a couple of reasons. First, many had strong personal biases against anonymous writers, some calling them crackpots with selfish personal agendas. I'm sure many of us today would even agree with that sentiment. But second, from a more practical standpoint, requiring real names was an easy way to limit the number for publication. However, it can be argued that these real names policies violate a basic tenet of journalism, which is to give voice to the voiceless. Now on the news side, we, as reporters, we often use anonymous sources. Of course, we're careful to vet the information first. But editors have been unwilling to extend this practice to letters. And it is the voiceless who are most hurt by these policies. A 2004 national survey done at the Scripps School of Journalism found that 35% of people who had never before written a letter to the editor 
would be willing to do so if their name wouldn't be used. And among those people, women, minorities, and urban residents, in other words, the poor, figured prominently. So you can see that these um, real names policies tend to benefit the powerful and the status quo. Now, as many newspapers have seen a decline in the number of letters they receive since the advent of online commenting, and there's pressure from certain members of the community to bring those real names policies to the comments. But if these real names policies discourage the powerless from voicing their opinion in letters, they do so in spades for online comments. In a letter to the editor, it's printed in the newspaper, a few hundred people, a thousand people read it, and then it disappears into the archives. But information posted online can haunt a job hunter for years to come. I've seen this happen. Now, in 2012 at AnnArbor.com, we surveyed our readers to find out if they'd be willing to verify their identities in order to comment. The vast majority said no. I believe it would have been hell no if they could have said so. <laughs> And the reason most frequently cited was job concerns. Now think about it. If you're the owner of a business in town, would you really feel comfortable commenting about local political issues for the whole community to read? Wouldn't you worry that you might alienate potential customers who don't agree with you? The same concern goes for doctors, attorneys, uh, nonprofit leaders, service industry workers, many of you in this room, I'm sure. Public sector employees have also expressed this concern. I've seen teachers comment on our site using their real names, and many have told me about the backlash they received at their school for doing so. And what about low-income residents who live in areas of violent crime? How likely are they to comment using their real names about the problems they face in their communities? Still, people argue, it would be worth the reduction in participation. It would be worth cutting all these people out of the discussion if we could just make online conversations civil. And the assumption that real names leads to civility is difficult to argue against because it feels so intuitive for most of us, right? And if we could just force people to use their real names, then we'd no longer have problems with incivility and bullying online, right? One of the girls who allegedly bullied Florida teen Rebecca Sedwig literally to death posted this defiant message on Facebook. But she's a kid, right? And she, kids don't know any better, adults know better, right? This comment was posted on a story about a carjacking in Detroit, again, by someone using his real identity. This comment was posted about a girl who is likely the victim of a sexual predator, a 37-year-old family friend, again, by someone using his real name. Now, the thing is, I didn't just cherry pick these. I could fill slide after slide after slide with examples like this. I periodically visit news sites that use Facebook for comments and just see how long it takes me to find a racist, sexist, homophobic, or otherwise offensive comment. It's kind of a twisted game. <laughs> <laughs> um, usually, it's a mere matter of minutes. And on our own Facebook page, our MLive Facebook page, we get comments like this too. Often they're worse than anything our anonymous commenters post on the site itself. See, going beyond my own anecdotes, there's been some research on commenter identity. Discuss, which is a popular blog commenting platform, looked at their users um, and discovered that the most productive members of the community are those who use pseudonyms. They comment more frequently, and their comments are rated more positively as even, than even those who use their real names, as indicated by the number of likes and replies. Now this research makes some interest, an interesting point I want to stress, and that is usually when we're talking about anonymous comments, we're actually talking about pseudonymous comments. Because on most sites, um, like I'm live, a user has to create an account, tie it to a real email address, and use that account every time they comment. Over time, they build up a comment history, they have a place in the community, and they tend to take pride in this online persona that they've created. Now, another study done this year at the University of Houston compared comments on sites, news sites that allow anonymous comments to comments on sites that use Facebook for comments. 
and analyze the two. On the anonymous sites, which I want to stress, the ones they looked at don't use the community management techniques I'm going to talk about in a bit. But on those sites, 50% of comments were deemed uncivil. On the Facebook sites, 30% were uncivil. Now, granted, that is a good reduction, right? But it's still 30% uncivil. And this is with people using their real names. So you can see from these numbers that anonymity is not actually the problem. The problem is, I believe, the lack of the intimacy of, of interpersonal communication, face-to-face -face communication. It's a problem with any written communication, but I believe it's heightened by the ease, the shareability, the megaphone of online postings. We as a society are learning how to adapt to this mode of communication. And merely requiring real names does nothing to teach people how to be civil online. Where I see it being tried, three things happen. The first is that there's a steep reduction in participation because most people don't want to use their real names. The second is that uh, most of the remaining discourse becomes bland because those who will participate using their real names are inhibited from sharing their true thoughts. And the third thing is that, well, you still get the 30% who are jerks and they just don't care. So when I told my daughter I was giving this talk defending anonymous commenters, she said, why would you do that? You hate Spartan Bob. <laughs> and it's true, I do hate Spartan Bob. <laughs> However, my family tends to hear about the worst commenters. And uh, the reality is on MLive, our anonymous commenters contribute in a number of valuable ways. The first that most people want to think about is whistleblowing. Um, but those types of comments are rare. And in any case, you know, like with that principal comment, we usually remove a whistleblowing comment, at least until we can verify the information it contains. More often, commenters are adding tips and bits of information on stories going beyond what our reporters have written. Usually it's because they're connected with the story and they have that information to share. We see this a lot on accidents, crimes, you know, eyewitnesses to, to breaking news um, will add their their thoughts about what they saw, like this guy who saw the aftermath of a crime scene. Now on tragic stories, we also see vic relatives of victims getting in the comments and um, adding information, like this father who wrote, the woman killed was my daughter. Her son was life flighted to Mott's and is in stable condition. Commenters also give us constructive feedback, and this can sometimes have humorous results, as in the case where a commenter took, a, a, many commenters actually, took a reporter to task for calling 20 grams of marijuana lots of pot. 20 grams is a large quantity. <laughs> Maybe to a Lilliputian, wrote this commenter, kicking some drug and literary knowledge in the same breath. <laughs> but most frequently, or I should say most importantly, our anonymous commenters generate conversations about problems in the community and discuss solutions. A study published in MIS Quarterly found that when people are anonymous, they are more creative and more willing to discuss difficult topics critically. We see this a lot on MLive, as in this example where a woman, she was commenting on an affirmative action story, and she launched a very frank discussion about race between several commenters when she wrote, I am a woman of engineer of mixed Native American and white heritage, and I'm deeply and profoundly against affirmative action. And she went on to state why. Unfortunately, when people are anonymous, they're less likely to be taken seriously. And if not dismissed outright as trolls. And this dismissive attitude, as with letters previously, is leading some news editors to take drastic measures to either eliminate comments or um, force you know, real names or eliminate comments completely. And I truly think that this is a throwing the baby out with the bathwater move because there are proven ways to keep online conversations civil. The three steps to bringing civility to an online community are govern, engage, evolve. 
Governing refers to all the ways the site moderates its comments. And for me, that includes setting clear rules and enforcing them through warnings and comment removals. Um, maintaining a public blog where people can ask questions and get answers about why their comments were removed. As in this case, when I said, hey, calling people cronies and entitled idiots crossed the line. <laughs> and third, emailing rule breakers to let them know why their comment was removed or why their account was banned. Sometimes commenters are receptive to this, as in this email where the guy said, you know, sometimes it doesn't occur to me that someone would read my words who could be hurt. Other times, I get a virtual mooning in response. And I promise you, I have, I have artfully cropped this for you to spare you. <laughs> this is the type of commenter who is likely to cry censorship and complain that his First Amendment rights are being violated. To which I respond, you have no First Amendment rights on MLive. I'm sorry. The First Amendment does not apply to the website of a private company. But I also remind them that outside of hate speech, it is possible to say pretty much anything you want to say. And you keep it civil, and it won't be deleted. The second step, engage, refers to reporters participating in the comments with the commenters, answering questions, of course, but also asking their own in order to guide conversations and lead them down a productive path like this reporter did when he wrote about a story touching on gay marriage, always a tricky issue. And he asked several questions, several pointed questions of commenters. And the discussion was so civil and on topic that nothing had to be removed. I know this works. Author engagement works to keep conversations civil. And a study by the Engaging News Project this year confirms that. The final step, evolve, means never stop demanding more of your commenters. You got rid of the isms? Great. Now work on name calling and personal attacks. And then tackle drive-by comments and low-value one-liners like, thanks, Obama. And then challenge commenters who push misinformation. I'm also working on a series of columns educating readers how to discuss hot-button topics like abortion in a civil way, without violating the rules. It's a, in many ways similar to how I teach my kids to communicate. Like in here where I, you know, it's use a lot of I statements rather than you statements. Here I say talk generally about what your religion teaches rather than tell someone they're going to hell. Now these are some of the hallmarks of a well-managed community. And I hope that if you recognize a well-managed community and the topic interests you, you'll feel comfortable joining the conversation. Your perspectives can help shape public opinion, help find solutions to problems in your communities. I also hope that you will think a little differently about anonymous commenters, that you'll be more willing to look past the lack of identity and consider a comment on the merits of its content. I truly believe that online comments can be a positive force in the community for, for constructive community dialogue especially as those who traditionally haven't had a voice are able to voice their opinions. And maybe one day, maybe when my son is old enough to participate, we will have adapted enough to online communication that civility will be the norm, real names or not. <laughs>